So without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome Becca as our presenter today. Becca Wellna is a community educator with the Sojourner Project. For the past 40 years, Sojourner has been providing free and confidential support to those victimized by domestic and sexual violence in Western Hennepin County. As part of the Outreach and Education Department, Becca enjoys sharing the stories of survivors' resilience and raising awareness of the need for Sojourner's essential services. She finds particular joy in teaching Safe You, Sojourner's youth violence prevention education in local middle and high schools. She recently went back to school for a graduate certificate in content strategy and storytelling and loves working creatively to share the on the ground impact stories with the larger community. Prior to her current work, Becca was a youth counselor at a teen crisis shelter in San Francisco, focused on family reunification and stabilization. When not at Sojourner, Becca enjoys practicing and teaching yoga, hanging out with her nephews, and serving on the board of Minnesota Peace Building Leadership Institute. Lots of great, super interesting things. Welcome, Becca. Glad to have you here, and the floor is yours, ma'am. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be here with you guys today. Um, I know we all have probably lots on our mind today, so I really appreciate you guys all taking this hour to be together and I'm even feeling the warmth from your happy bucks. It's a great, um, a great way to um, practice gratitude. So um, as was mentioned, I'm a community educator with Sojourner and um, I'd like to focus on prevention education and community outreach. So um, today I'm just going to be talking about um, what Sojourner does as well as some updates um, regarding how the pandemic has impacted our work and our clients. Um, so as I mentioned in uh, my little bio, uh, last year Sojourner celebrated our 40th anniversary um, of working to create safer relationships, families, and communities. So we were started by two brave, resourceful women um, in Hopkins named Kitty Alcott and Jenny Armand, and they saw and documented domestic violence happening in the community as well as the silence and the shame and lack of resources that were available to um, what were known at, at that time as battered women. And so um, they started one of the first shelters in, in Minnesota for women and um, kind of from that DNA, we now do our work. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. We'll see uh, every time I always am like, is it gonna work? Thus far it has. All right, so, um, and twice today my, uh, my sound has cut out. So I'm hoping that that won't be an issue, but if it does, it's kind of, it's always come right back. So just bear with me um, and if it does, and you can always throw into the chat if you can't hear me. So Sojourner's mission is really to, um, to advocate for victim safety. We are trying to support the transition from victim to survivor, and we want to educate for the prevention and ultimately elimination of domestic violence. Our services are all free and confidential, and they're available 24 seven. So I won't go through too many statistics about domestic violence, but I do wanna just acknowledge what drives our work. Um, uh, on average, about 20 people every minute are physically abused by an intimate partner here in the US. And in one year, that equates to about 10 million men and women. On any typical day, there are more than 20,000 phone calls to domestic violence hotlines nationwide. Um, and we know that there are significant mental, physical, and behavioral health effects of domestic violence, including intimate partner homicide. So th thus far in Minnesota, um, in 2020, 20, um, so it says there are 24, it's actually 22 people who've been killed in, in, in Minnesota thus far. And um, that includes folks, not just who are um, the partners themselves, but also family members, neighbors, um, first responders, all of those folks um, we know are, are impacted by domestic violence. And domestic violence is a, a community issue with community costs. Um, and we really believe that it will take community solutions. Um, to change, to change this from happening. So I, I do want to take the time to share just a five minute video um, that I think does a nice job explaining about what Sojourner does in the voices of our staff and clients. So if you don't already have the screen full screen, I would invite you to make sure that your Zoom is full screen because it does have an impact on the quality of video playback. So um, 
I also want to just acknowledge that the first minute or two of this video does talk about um, violence, physical violence. And so if you're just not feeling up for that today, I really want you to honor, honor your needs and you're welcome to mute, um, to mute the video for the first minute or two if you need to do so. Um, and I'm just going to double check to make sure that the sound goes through because there is a piece that needs to be done sure. on my end. And so I sure. want to make sure. Thank you. Of course, I don't do this very often. And Yeah, and if it doesn't work, no, no worries. I can share what's in the video, but. I, do. I think I set it up so it should be that everybody can hear through because otherwise it can count, sound kind of um, kind of delayed. Okay, well, let's give it a try. You guys can let me know either in chat or um, over audio. He had strangled me a couple of times. He had threatened to break my jaw. He told me repeatedly that he wishes he could physically harm me. He threatened to kill me in front of my two youngest children. My younger daughter, she pulled him off of me and I ran out of the house and he chased me out with a knife. I was constantly accused of doing or thinking or having intentions that I didn't have. No matter what I explained, he was convinced that I was lying, convinced that I was cheating on him, hiding something. And I was afraid of his outbursts and afraid of his anger. I was pregnant with my son. I didn't want to have my son around um, my abuser. And I just wanted a better life for my daughter and my son. Before coming across Sojourner, my life really was filled with fear. I was afraid to do anything. I was afraid to look the wrong direction or be five minutes late coming home from work. I needed to be able to get away from the emotional abuse, the threats, um, occasional physical abuse, and be able to figure out my next move. We help women by letting them know about their options that they have available to them including legal options and resources that are available to them. And we can help them to navigate those systems, including the legal systems, and to access those resources that they need for their family. They never told me what I should do, but they helped me evaluate my options and maybe pointed me in a direction or giving me a viewpoint that I wasn't necessarily seeing on my own. I've been getting counseling here at Sojourner, and I've been getting um, help with my advocates to help me, you know, put some pieces back into my life. I worked with the advocate to file a restraining order. And so we ended up having to go to court and my advocate prepared everything above and beyond any expectations. Um, she was by my side 100% the entire time. The criminal side of it in the court case is very scary for someone who doesn't really understand how it works. Um, so right away, giving them that ease of how the process works, what their role is in it, and where it's going to go from beginning, middle, to the end of the case really gives them a better understanding of how things are going to work, what their role is, and where things are going. All the information that Sojourner had and provided to me so willingly it was amazing and it really made me get through it. I know firsthand how a life can be transformed. For my mother who was battered and abused, she didn't have these services available. I did have these services available and was able to change my life 
And I always thought if I could just help one person to do the same, that would be so worth it. And I have loved the work ever since. My life today is way better. <laughs> it's, it's so peaceful. There isn't a, that constant level of anxiety in my life anymore. I feel a lot calmer, a lot more at ease. I feel like I'm back to myself. My hope is to move forward and not look back. And I know that everything is gonna be okay. And it just makes me feel so good to know that I can raise my daughter and my son and without someone trying to hurt me. To be able to be a part of someone's story and helping them get to the next spot in their life where they want to be to find hope and happiness and really coming back to identifying their own self-awareness, self-esteem. It's amazing to be a part of that journey. So hopefully that um, gives you all a bit of a sense of the impact of our work. I really like to share that video when I present because I think um, there is no comparison to hearing people talk about their own experience. Um, and um, so, so yeah, that's just a few of the stories of, of Sojourner's work. And just to talk a little bit about um, our impact in terms of numbers, each year we serve around 400 women and children in our emergency shelter and then around 900 men and women via our community program which impacts around 300 um, plus children from that work. We take around 2,800 calls on our crisis line each year and depending on the year do between 200 to 250 presentations or um, trainings for professionals in the community. Um, so before I talk more um, in detail about our programs, I do just want to give a little bit of an overview about what we mean when we talk about domestic violence. There's lots of myths and misconceptions about what domestic violence is. And so um, when we talk about domestic violence, we're really talking about a pattern of uh, abusive or coercive behavior, which is used to try to either get control or keep control over someone else. So typically it's in an intimate partnership, um, dating, or marriage. It could be a, a former um, intimate partner, um, but it could also be within a family, um, two adults within a family, or even cohabitants, so roommates, things like that, actually fall under the legal definition of domestic violence. And just to be clear about what it's not, um, it's not just physical abuse. There's so many other aspects of domestic violence that contribute to someone's um, experience of an abusive relationship. And then um, there are also misconceptions about what causes domestic violence. So we know that it's not caused by anger management problems or substance use or abuse or mental illness. Um, certainly substance abuse can contribute to the intensity or the lethality of violence, um, but it's not the cause of domestic violence. We know that really domestic violence is about one person choosing to use their power to control someone else, a sense of entitlement um, over being able to control the situation or relationship. Um, and when I talk about mental illness, I like to also point out that actually folks who are um, dealing with mental illness are much more likely to experience harm or experience violence themselves and to be per perpetrators of that harm. Um, and then when I say it doesn't discriminate, what I mean is that anyone can be a victim of domestic violence. So we worked with folks of all different genders, ages, um, race and ethnicities, cultural backgrounds, sexual orientations, uh, economic status. We have folks who in our homeless are staying with us in the shelter and we have folks that we work with who are you know living on million dollar homes on Lake Minnetonka so um you know it really runs the gamut um that being said I do think it's important to acknowledge that you know statistically women are much more likely to be um the to, to receive harm in terms of severe physical or sexual violence and those who identify as male are are certainly more likely to be perpetrators we also know that um you know, violence of all kinds impacts folks who experience um, societal oppression or marginalization um, to greater degrees. And so things like experiencing racism, homophobia, prejudice, that can all compound, compound rather the experience of domestic violence. 
And of course, a lack of financial resources or access to financial support can really significantly um, impact whether or not someone is able to safely and sustainably leave an abusive relationship. So just some things to think about. Um, I did want to share with you all the Wheel of Power and Control. Um, some of you might be very familiar with it already, and some of you, this might be the first time you've seen it. So for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through all of, um, all of the wheel, but it is uh, a nice visual, I think, to start to understand some of the different tactics that abusers use um, to, to maintain or gain that power and control over their, their partner or their victim. So this was actually created um, up in Duluth. Um, and it's now part of the Duluth model, which is sort of a, an odd claim to fame for Minnesota to have, but the Duluth model is used nationwide and if not globally to have an understanding of domestic violence. So if this is something that you're interested in learning more about, um, you want to understand more um, in depth about what causes domestic violence, what it really looks like, I would invite you all to come to uh, a free webinar that we're going to have on November 3rd. Not November 3rd, <laughs> that's today, December 3rd rather. Um, so um, in a month and that information will be posted on our website, how to access it, um, but we're going to spend about an hour just really getting into detail about what does domestic violence look like, how can we address it in our communities. So um, I will say that, um, you know, there are a lot of very common strategies that are used by abusers. This wheel was created um, by having focus groups with uh, women, uh, specifically with straight women at the time, although this wheel can be adapted for anyone, um, to talk about what are the things that you're experiencing. And there were so many commonalities that they came up with. They were finding all these things that were, regardless of the relationship um, happening, things like isolation, economic abuse, um, minimizing some of their behavior, things like that. So coercive control is a term that I like to, to use when I'm talking about domestic violence. And it really refers to the, the combination of abusive tactics that abusers use, things like, I mentioned isolation, micromanagement, manipulation, stalking, certainly physical abuse and sexual coercion, threats, punishments. And um, an abuser might not use all of these tactics or might vary when they use them, but um, combined and used over time are very effective strategies for control. So um, that's really what we're talking about when we're thinking about domestic violence. And so I do just want to acknowledge too that, you know, domestic violence doesn't just affect the, the folks who are in the relationship, but the whole family. Um, and that's part of our work at Sojourner too, is acknowledging that um, domestic violence affects the children um, in the home, both through our shelter program, but also when we work with folks in the community. Um, you know, witnessing or experiencing domestic violence during childhood is known as an adverse childhood experience. So many of you may be familiar with, with that term, ACEs, um, but if you're not, it's, it's, a, um, it's an acknowledging that there are, there are things that a child can go through, trauma that a child can go through in childhood, which have long-term effects on someone's, or have the potential to have long-term effects on someone's physical, mental, and behavioral health. Um, that being said, we know and believe that children are remarkably resilient and are, are absolutely able to heal from trauma with intervention and support. So um, that's kind of fundamental to our, to our belief when we're working with kids at Sojourner as well. And I don't have a slide about this, but I do just want to acknowledge that elder abuse is also something that we are really seeing in our communities. Um, our oldest client that we worked with was 96. We, uh, I, our executive director was looking through the numbers and originally thought this has to be a typo, right? It has to be 69, it can't be 96, but it, it really was. It was a, an older gentleman and he was being um, abused by a caregiver in his life. And so um, that is certainly something that is more and more visible now as our population ages and that we're continuing to address at Sojourner. So I want to talk a little bit about our programs and, and as I mentioned, kind of describe how COVID is, is impacting, um, it's impacting our work. You know, I think it's impacted all of our lives um, in, in various ways, but um, few more so than folks who are already experiencing significant trauma or violence and who are vulnerable to, to um, isolation. So we have four main programs, our crisis line, our shelter, our community legal advocacy, and our outreach. So 
The shelter is meant to be safe, free, and confidential emergency housing for women and their children. So women can come from anywhere in Minnesota and typically find us through a program called Day One, which um, is really wonderful. It's um, a website and a phone number where all of the shelters in Minnesota um, are connected. So instead of someone having to, you know, if they're, if they're needing emergency shelter, having to call every shelter and see if there's space, there's a place they can go all in one um, to, to find out how they can get help. And so that's the kind of the main way that people come to our shelter, but they can certainly self-refer by calling our crisis line or sometimes our police partners or healthcare providers will refer folks to us for shelter as well. So the, the video went over many of the services that we offer, but um, I'll just name a few more of them. So when somebody first comes in, we're really addressing their immediate needs. Do they need medical care? Um, do they need some crisis counseling, some emotional support? Um, do they have the food, the basic toiletries, the clothing that they need? Everything is provided for, everything as, as much as possible is provided for when folks are staying with us at the shelter. Um, and then we do what's called a day two uh, intake, typically on the second day, which is to sit down and talk about what are your goals when you're when you're staying with us. How can we help support you um, with what you're looking to get out of this time here? So obviously, um, folks are generally looking for safe and affordable housing, which is oftentimes the hardest thing to find, unfortunately. Um, but also things like, you know, does your child need um, to be transferred to a different school? You know, maybe their abuser knows where the kids go to school and it's not safe for them to continue there. You know, we can help them to navigate the things that they need for their, for their children. Do you need some mental health supports? You know, can we connect you to other community resources? Do you need um, access to something like PRISM? You know, all these different places that we can connect people to, um, that's part of our work as well. And then the crisis line is um, staffed by folks at the shelter, as well as during non-COVID times, our lovely trained volunteers, which we miss so much right now. Um, as you guys were talking about earlier, it's been such a challenge with knowing how to navigate volunteers um, in the nonprofit world right now. But um, our, our crisis line is important because it's an opportunity for us to screen for shelter, as well as you know assess for people's safety and help them plan for safety. Um, and to, to connect them to either internal resources like our legal advocates or other external community resources that would be helpful for them. Um, and so some of the COVID-19 updates, you know, as you can imagine, having a shelter um, is a pretty big deal during the COVID times. We are a community living shelter, mean typic meaning typically people um, are staying together in shared rooms. Um, and so we've had definitely had to adapt our we have stayed open throughout the pandemic. We are, you know, of course, considered an essential service and are employing masks and social distancing and um, cleaning protocols and all those kinds of things. Um, but it has impacted our ability to house um, the number of folks that we typically do. We got very creative. We got um, we bought a portable bed and have transformed one of the playrooms into an extra bedroom. So really, just trying to be agile, adaptable, and really get people what they need as much as possible. We're also working with folks who are staying in some of the hotel programs that have um, arisen during this time, um, just in an acknowledgement that the shelters are often full at this point and people really need some place to go. So um, we're providing advocacy to folks who are um, staying in the hotels as well. And then I mentioned before, we, have, we can't have volunteers in our space at this time and we're not able to do group programming. So we're really missing that a lot, but our advocates have tried to be very creative and entertaining families and the community has really stepped up. We put an ask out over the summer for um, some toys, like summer games for the kids, outdoor stuff, you know, typically we would be taking them to pools or trying to do fun things with the kids during the summer, but um, the community was very helpful in, in helping us to adapt um, to still make it a, a joyful experience as much as possible while people are staying with us. So. It's so a little bit about our shelter. Our community legal advocates provide really similar services to shelter services, but it's for folks who either don't want or need to come into shelter. And, and this is for and men and women um, and various different ages. As I mentioned, lots of different folks work with us um, in the community and um, they do need to be in our service area. So we serve Western Hennepin County. We have, I think, 16 communities that we work with specifically. 
um, and they can either live there or, you know, they might work there, whatever is, um, whatever is most convenient for them. We want to be able to make sure that they access those services. So our advocates are always doing safety assessments and safety planning with all of the folks that we work with, trying to make sure that we're helping them to figure out how they can be as safe as possible um, in the situation that they're in. Um, and our, our, our legal advocates are really trained and knowledgeable professionals. They know a lot about the legal system and um, do a lot of their work in the criminal justice system. So um, you see intervention here. Intervention is, um, it's housed in community advocacy, but it's really, I think of it as its own program. So intervention is our partnership with the police departments that are in our service area. So we have nine different police partnerships um, police departments rather that we work with. And so this allows us to provide immediate services to someone who has been a victim of a domestic assault and, and the police have come to the home or come to the situation. So there's been a 911 call um, and there's been an arrest. The police will both give the victim our information, but also reach out to us as soon as possible so that we can then independently reach out to the victim and let them know, hey, you know, here are some of your options. Um, just so you know, this is a free and confidential service that uh, is neutral. Um, we'll work with you, you know, whether you call the police or not, we're still going to be here and be available for you. Um, and we follow the case if there's been an arrest from a arrest all the way through probation. So um, sometimes folks are happy to hear from us and want the support and sometimes not so much and that's really okay. We're still going to follow the case because we know things are um, unfortunately likely to continue to happen or someone might change their mind um, and we really want to make sure that we are available to them throughout that process. Um, you, you see here we have uh, criminal and civil court advocacy. So what I mean by that is um, in civil court, there hasn't been an arrest, but somebody wants, you know, an order for protection or they're going through a divorce or there's custody issues coming up. All of that, um, all of that is work that our legal advocates will do as well. And then we offer therapy and support group, um, which, which is a really helpful thing for folks to have in terms of healing and support and resilience. Um, We've found over the last few months, actually, so we are up about 34%. And we've found that it's um, there's been an increase in the need for services um, as compared to last year. And we we feel that that is connected to, to COVID. Um, it's it's been well documented that in times in times like this, or if there's been a natural disaster, that rates of domestic violence rise. And so it's really hard to track because people aren't always able to report or um, reach out for services in the same way as, um, as when the crisis isn't happening. But um, our experience is that folks are asking for, for help um, and are needing help at a higher rate. Um, and then I, I would just add that uh, initially, when when COVID happened, we decided to move our support group to an asynchronous online um, program, meaning not meeting at the same time. Um, but after a couple months, we we had such a request from our clients saying that they really, really valued support group and really wanted and needed that time together that we decided to figure out a way to as safely as possible hold support group. Um, so we keep it a low number. We have social distancing and masking um, and have adapted the format a little bit, but we are currently offering support group in person for folks and we're very hopeful to be able to continue to do that um, just depending on how you know, how everything plays out. And um, as cases rise, we may have to adjust, but um, it's been something that we've been glad to be able to safely continue because um, we see we see the need for it. Um, and then the last thing that I'll just talk about is our, our community outreach and education, which um, has moved all online. So um, exactly what I'm doing right now is a lot of what I've been doing the last couple of months. Oop. Um, sorry about that. It looks like my screen popped up. Uh, okay, here we go. We're back. So um, we've moved all of our, our trainings uh, for professionals and our community outreach presentations online to formats like this, um, as well as focusing a lot on our social media and, um, you know, kind of old school flyers and mailings and all that kind of good stuff, trying to get all this information out there. Um, 
I mentioned earlier in my bio the work that we do uh, around safe you our youth violence prevention education it's been very different as with all schooling anybody who has kids knows <laughs> school has been very different these last few months but um, we are happy to be able to continue to um, to do online safe you um, so typically safe you is three days in the classroom, experiential, engaging, lots of um, games and discussion, information um, for young people to understand what are the expectations around relationships, what are some, you know, warning signs, red flags, how do you access services or supports for yourself or your friends. And so um, while we can't have it look the same way, um, it, it now looks a little bit like this. So we have um, uh, video presentations and trying to do games online and we're offering both synchronous and asynchronous versions. Um, the two schools that I think would be most relevant to you guys would be, um, so we're in Robbinsdale Armstrong High School, we do all of their health classes. Um, and then we also are in, we do a, an elective class at Hopkins High School. So, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to the time when we can be back in the classroom with our students because I really miss it. But um, I, I truly believe that this information is so critical to the prevention and, and, and early intervention of domestic violence that I'm glad that we're able to still do it um, online. So um, just briefly, you know, you guys are all so engaged with your community already, but I will just share a couple of things that we often tell people they can do to be involved with us. So these are all of our volunteer opportunities, which um, post COVID, who, who knows when that will be, but someday we'll have some of these volunteering opportunities available again. Um, you know, we really like to have groups come in and do meal preparation and different um, kinds of projects for us, um, which might be great for you guys to do as a group if that was something you were interested in. And, um, and then of course, you know, we take financial donations as folks are interested and able. Um, I coordinate our in-kind donations. So I will put in a little plug for our holiday um, boutique coming up. Um, usually we transform our boardroom. We make it this really exciting, fun kind of shopping experience for parents to come in and pick out what they want for their kiddos. This year, it won't look quite like that. It'll be a different format, but we're still collecting toys. I've set up an um, Amazon and Target registries for folks to just be able to add things to their cart and send it our way so we can share it with the families that we serve. So if you're interested in any of that information, you can find it all on our website. So I'll just pop um, our website into the chat once I'm done talking. And then if you all are curious to learn more, um, you can check it out there. But, you know, the biggest thing you can do um, is just making sure that folks know that these services are free, confidential, and available. And, you know, I'm not going to be able to talk to everyone in the community, but each of us will be able to talk to someone. And so really um, helping us to have that warm handoff for anybody that you know or you work with um, to, to be able to trust us to hopefully walk alongside them if they need some help um, is, is such a Makes such a difference. So um, I have a couple minutes for questions if there are any, but um, otherwise, you know, thank you all so much for giving me the time to share about this work. Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Becca. Mm -hmm. What Is questions do we have, folks? I, I know have, they're out there. I have a question. Yes. Um, you mentioned a number of things that do not cause domestic violence. Mm -hmm. what, what are some of the causes? Sure. Yeah, so um, I'm going to finish my screen share. It's a great question. So there, there isn't necessarily one thing that we can point to, you know, as much as I, I would like to be able to give you an easy answer, I would say um, a couple different things that I that I think about as factors. Um, so violence is a learned behavior, certainly. So, you know, experiencing violence yourself, um, having been a victim of violence can certainly impact whether or not somebody is a perpetrator of harm. It's not in any way a one-to-one -one kind of cause, but it is a factor that can influence people. Um, and knowing that violence can be learned not just from experiencing it within, you know, a family or relationship, but also um, observing it societally and seeing how violence is, is dealt with in our culture. Um, I would also say kind of social forces, like very limited, um, definitions of masculinity can be a factor, right? Um, believing that uh, masculinity means aggression and dominance um, and believing that there's a, a sense of um, entitlement to your right as a person to be the dominant force within the family um, can certainly be something that, that we see as a common belief or a common factor for folks who are, um, who are abusers. 
And also, you know, either believing or experiencing that violence gets you what you want and that there aren't necessarily consequences for that violence. So those are a few of the things, um, you know, that I think about, but it's, it's quite complicated. You know, it, it's, it's like any other um, issue, like, you know, any other issue like addiction or, or um, homelessness, right? There isn't that one particular thing that we can point to. I think if there was, um, it would be much easier to solve, but, but I do think, you know, um, learning about re what healthy relationships look like and, and developing the skills to, to communicate, to deal with your emotions, to have healthy gender expectations, all those things are, are great prevention tools um, and the things that we try to teach in our CFU. Yeah, Becca, I had put a question in the chat there. You had talked about the CDC ACE report, yeah. Adverse Childhood Experiences. And mm -hmm. um, um, I think what really, in my observations, these things get passed down through the family. A dysfunctional family is, is teaching future families <laughs> as, the, as the kids grow up um, to maintain a dysfunctional um, relationship. Um, and so when you're talking about the therapies with children, um, things really change after they become adults and they start having um, dating relationships. And in the back of their minds, they're going back to how mother and dad behaved. Um, so I was just wondering what kind of um, longitudinal therapy you look at for people who have been in, in abusive families. Sure. That's a great, that's a great question. I would say, I think it's a factor for folks. Absolutely. I would also say, you know, we've seen it go both ways. I've seen folks who were, um, who grew up in households where there were violence, who are, have committed to saying, I don't, I don't ever want to have that in my life. And I'm not going to be, you know, I saw dad and he treated my mom like this and I will never treat someone like that. So, you know, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, it can go both ways and it can be a factor. Um, Either way for folks, I Sojourner doesn't do any terms of any term any longitudinal um, tracking of our clients, so I can't speak to that in terms of Sojourner. Um, but um, it's a great question, and and I, I would be very interested in seeing in seeing some research. I do think you know a lot of the studies show that for young people, even having one trustworthy and safe adult can can absolutely be transformative for young people. One person that they feel like believes in them can help to show them a different way um, to be in relationship, whether it's um, an intimate relationship or, or not, really community relationship, friendship is um, such a huge intervention um, that's shown to be very effective. And then um, frankly, like other supports that we might not always think about as being, um, as important to domestic violence, things like safe housing, <laughs> access to the food that you need, um, feeling like you have a purpose and you matter, uh, you have your employee, like all of these things I think also contribute to our, to our intimate relationships. And um, I think if we think about it holistically, there's a lot of um, good work to be done around these issues. I'm, I'm curious along the same vein of how many of, would you just guesstimate of the folks that you are serving are experiencing poverty as well? Yeah, um, I, I mean, 100% of our shelter clients, okay. for sure. I don't think, I shouldn't say 100%, but I would say most of our shelter clients, you know, people aren't, people don't want to come into shelter unless they absolutely have to, especially, you know, at the beginning with COVID, so many people were just trying to do whatever they could to, you know, paying for their own hotels, things like that before they come into shelter. And then really in the community too. I mean, it's a big, it's a big thing. We have folks who are, some of the tactics that abusers will use would be things like, hey, I'm going to stop by and I'll bring diapers. You know, if you want, I'll bring diapers. If you want to see me, things like that, where it's like, if you're trying to decide between whether or not your kid has what they need and you're going to see this person who you know you really shouldn't, but they're going to help provide, it's like that's a, a complicated thing to try to um, navigate as a parent, especially. Um, so I don't have an exact number for you, but I would say it's significant. Yeah. I'm aware well, that we're at time, but if we are. I want to ask 12 questions, but I won't. We are <laughs> at time, so I want to respect. Uh, um, well, 
let me throw my email into the chat um, as well as our website. And um, that way if folks, you know, do want to learn more or are interested in coming to that training that I mentioned in December um, right. or finding out more about our boutique, if that's something that you would like to support over the holidays, you can find that information there. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much, Becca, for your time. This is very informative. Um, I suspect that there's, like I said, much more conversation that could be had. And um, as a club, we'll, we'll talk and see if this is something that maybe we want to revisit or continue to dig into, because as you said, it really is so complex. Um, makes understanding it not a simple piece. And research, um, you know, we can look to universities to see what kind of research perhaps they have. So thank you very much. In conclusion, we're going to recite the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build good will and better friendships? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you to our guest speaker and our visitors. You guys are always welcome to come back and join us at any time. Glad to have you. If you haven't voted, get out and vote. Enjoy the sunshine, everybody. Stay healthy. Wash your hands. <laughs>